Uh, we are live from the Falmouth Hotel on what is the first day of the G7 Leaders Summit here in Cornwall, uh, where, as you know, one of the key topics of discussion is the climate change crisis and how we respond to it. As a region, we are on the cusp of a green industrial revolution and so are delighted to be hosting what will be a stimulating discussion around floating offshore winds role in tackling climate change and how the Celtic Sea, Cornwall and the wider UK can accelerate the scale up necessary to ensure this exciting industry can fulfil its global potential. I am really very grateful to all the speakers and panel members who are all in the room with us today and, and that, that just feels um, great because we've not done that for a long time. Uh, but also to our live audience, uh, who include um, all the offshore wind developers who are active in the region at the moment. So great, great to see you all. I know it's not been the easiest place to get to or get accommodation, so, so great to see you here. I'm also really grateful to all of those who have joined via the webinar and also who are watching us via the live stream. We wish you could be with us, um, but we do appreciate your patience with, um, with uh, how we've had to operate under current COVID restrictions. So we have a range of presentations today with, with plenty of time for questions, answers and comments throughout. And we'd like this to be as interactive as we possibly can. Uh, so if you could use the Q&A function in the Zoom webinar, uh, we will do our best to work through as many comments and questions as we can through the day. Um, however, anything unanswered or any questions that come up after the event, we will look to get those answered and to you post, post the event. So that's enough from me. Uh, and without further delay, could I ask to, you to welcome to the stage our keynote speaker, the Right Honourable George Eustace MP, Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Well, thank you very much, Matt. And it's a, a real uh, pleasure to be here today. In fact, the first uh, proper meeting I've done for some time, albeit uh, a hybrid meeting, and I think this is probably something we may uh, learn to do uh, going forward, where we have uh, a number of uh, people joining uh, through the live stream, but also an audience here for the first time. But it's also a pleasure to be attending uh, this particular conference since uh, the Wave Hub project uh, is in my constituency uh, off the coast uh, of Hale. Uh, and over the last decade, uh, I've seen uh, lots and lots of different attempts to, to try to make this uh, project work and to really uh, deliver for it. Uh, there have been setbacks along the way, particularly on wave energy. But um, I just wanted to really take this opportunity at the beginning to congratulate and thank uh, Steve, Jeremy uh, and all of the team uh, at WaveHub uh, and Cornwall Council who've worked with him. Because I think over the last two years, we have actually seen uh, some you know, extraordinary uh, pro uh, progress, uh, particularly uh, with the potential of floating offshore wind that I'm going to um, return to in a moment. But first of all, just to set uh, some of the context uh, behind this, this year uh, is a really big year for the environment uh, internationally. The reason this conference is taking place uh, now, this week, is, uh, as you all know, uh, just down uh, the road at St Ives um, or at Harvest Bay, uh, we've got the, the G7 conference. Uh, later this year, we're also um, going to have the COP15, the Convention on Biodiversity COP at Kunming in China. Uh, that's a, a really big one this year because they will be revising the biodiversity targets that we commit to uh, internationally for the first time in 10 years, replacing the old uh, HE targets that were set in Japan a decade ago. And we've been doing a huge amount of work building a coalition of like-minded countries. Over 80 countries signed up to the Prime Minister's Leaders' Pledge for Nature, uh, which is seeking to inject real ambition uh, into uh, our commitments in that area. And indeed, at the uh, G7 um, uh, Climate and Environment Track a few weeks ago, uh, we uh, there committed to, to try to bend the curve on biodiversity decline by 2030. But of course, then in Glasgow later this year, we have COP26, where we will be seeking to get other countries to make more ambitious uh, commitments on their NDCs, those uh, uh, nationally determined contributions, uh, and, uh, and seeking um, uh, more, more ambition worldwide uh, to ensure that we can hit net zero by the middle uh, of this century, which is what we have to do uh, if we are to uh, prevent uh, global warming and uh, get us off the current trajectory we're on, which is three degrees warming by the end of the century. 
Now, in this context, the UK uh, has set its own NDC already uh, at uh, 68%. That's a 68% reduction against 1990 level baseline. Um, we've also uh, embraced the recommendation of the Climate Change Committee uh, to say uh, that by carbon budget six, that's 2035, uh, we will uh, be aiming for a 78% reduction. Uh, that's challenging, that's ambitious, but the reason uh, we are doing that is we have to do that if we are serious about remaining on course uh, to hit net zero by 2050. Um, so there's huge amounts um, uh, of change coming. To hit those highly ambitious targets, uh, we're going to need to be doing huge amounts on multiple fronts. But the one thing we have learned is that we can do this. Uh, so in the last decade, uh, we have um, seen already a 40% reduction in our carbon uh, emissions. That has come principally from the phenomenal success uh, and development and deployment of uh, offshore wind. And in this period where we've seen a 40% reduction in our CO2 emissions, we have also seen a 75% growth in our economy. So we know that we can have green growth, we can decarbonize uh, our economy, uh, but also see economic growth. It's not a choice uh, between the two. And this is where floating offshore wind uh, comes into our consideration. Uh, because if we're to hit some of these next milestones, particularly carbon budget six, we're going to need to see a dramatic increase even further in the deployment of offshore wind. Uh, we may need to be deploying up to around 10,000 uh, turbines. That's a huge uh, increase to hit those, uh, those targets in carbon budget six. And floating uh, offshore wind has got real uh, potential to enable us to expand that uh, because it enables us to deploy um, uh, offshore wind in deeper waters. Um, uh, we can deploy them further away from the coast where the visual impacts uh, may be lower uh, and crucially where the quality of the wind resource may in some cases be better. Uh, and there's also the possibility uh, that the environmental impacts of uh, floating offshore wind could be lower uh, than uh, conventional offshore wind, which I'll return to later. So the government recognises the huge potential uh, for floating offshore wind. Uh, that's why we made it a manifesto uh, commitment uh, to uh, move this forward and to uh, have it deployed. The Prime Minister has since, in his 10-point plan, uh, said that we have the ambition to be uh, deploying a gigawatt of floating offshore wind by 2030. And I know that uh, my colleagues in Bayes, uh, Kwasi Kwarteng, is looking very closely uh, at how we deliver that, uh, what we need to do uh, to the CFD uh, structures uh, in order to ensure uh, that we can uh, secure and deliver that particular ambition. And those of you uh, close to this will know that for several years, uh, there has been something of a, uh, a challenge for the less developed renewable energy sectors in that uh, they've all been asked really to um, attempt to compete with offshore wind, which has become highly established and where the costs have fallen dramatically. And in fact, one of the reasons uh, that um, we had a loss of momentum really in, in wave energy was uh, you know, the inability to get a, a particular carve out that recognised that they were on a different uh, part of the journey and weren't in a position to compete uh, with uh, uh, offshore wind. Now, I know that this, is, uh, this problem is now recognised, uh, and so um, the, it's already been made clear that conventional offshore wind is going to be moved into a, a different uh, pot so that uh, people don't have to compete with that. It's recognised that different technologies are at a different stage. Uh, and I know uh, that um, Kwasi Kwarteng and, uh, and his ministerial colleagues are looking very closely at what else they can do <coughs> to ensure uh, that those technologies like floating offshore wind that are a bit behind uh, offshore wind actually have the support they need in order to get past that first uh, pioneer stage. Now, the uh, other thing that is uh, happening alongside this, uh, as you will know, is that the Crown Estates uh, will shortly be uh, going to a, another consenting or leasing round uh, later, I think, in this autumn. I think you've got a presentation, actually, from Crown Estates uh, later this morning where they can tell you uh, more about this. And I think that's a, a very uh, important uh, signal because it, it gives the 
the confidence. So we get the financial incentives right to nurture some of these uh, new technologies like floating offshore wind and to get them past the, 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 the starting position. And then we also have um, the the pipeline of opportunities with a, a clear uh, trajectory to get to that one uh, gigawatt uh, offer later uh, by, by 2030. Um, now, the, the third area I just wanted to touch on is there's um, relating to WaveHub. And I know many of you here, developers, uh, um, looking at, at different projects. WaveHub is in my uh, constituency. Uh, uh, as I said earlier, <clears throat> there's been a recent change in ownership. Um, the council have now uh, transferred it to uh, Hexacon, which is a, uh, a Swedish uh, company. Um, they are going to be backed by uh, Bechtel, which is a very large um, uh, US uh, infrastructure company uh, to deploy floating offshore wind at WaveHub. And because that asset is already there and the infrastructure is already in place, uh, I think it's, uh, it's very likely that we will see floating offshore wind deployed first uh, at WaveHub. And that's a, a a really exciting opportunity and I think it's great that we've now got uh, that fabulous asset uh, with a commercial private sector operator so that we can move it uh, to the next level. So I think this is a huge opportunity. Uh, we, we face a, a change in the support system that opens the door to floating offshore wind. Um, we have a consenting round coming uh, from uh, Crown Estates and we also of course uh, now have um, WaveHub uh, putting, uh, being put into a position where it can capitalise on that uh, early uh, as a, at an early opportunity now my um, final uh, thought that I just wanted to touch on is uh, these things are never um, straightforward and when uh, you have such huge ambitions as we do as a government to deploy more offshore wind both conventional offshore wind but also floating offshore wind um, there are issues and there are um, uh, issues that we need to resolve and consequences that we need to uh, deal with. And many of those are issues that I have to deal with in DEFRA uh, as the Secretary of State is responsible for other bits of the environment rather than just um, climate change. And I just want to touch on some of the areas that we, we need to be thinking about uh, in parallel as we try to pursue this big ambition. Um, the first is we have to look very carefully at the impacts uh, on the seabed. If you have 10,000 wind turbines, that is uh, an enormous amount of new electrical cabling uh, that's going to have to be uh, coming ashore. <clears throat> we have to think about what happens when that cable needs to be replaced, uh, what happens when there's decommissioning. Uh, there are environmental uh, impacts associated uh, with that, uh, and we need to do everything we can to mitigate those uh, impacts. The second area relates to um, noise pollution, which you know, is a concern, particularly with marine mammals uh, and seals and harbour porpoise, but also for some migrating fish as well that uh, uh, use sonic signals to help them navigate. And increasingly, it's quite a challenge because the marine environment is becoming uh, quite noisy. And certainly during the construction phase, and this, is, and this will be years and years of construction, uh, noise pollution is something that we're going to need to think about. Uh, in some shallower waters, there's been success with things like uh, bubble curtains. Uh, that's probably less likely to work uh, in, in deeper waters, but it's something nevertheless that we need to uh, think about. Um, there is um, some concern around bird strike as well. Um, uh, not for all birds, uh, but particularly kittiwakes. There's been a concern uh, with some of the um, uh, wind turbines in, in some of the areas in the, the southern North Sea <coughs> that are leading to um, bird strike because they're on the, uh, the route uh, path for feeding grounds for, for kittiwakes. So we need to be sensitive and thoughtful about where we cite them uh, so that we uh, reduce uh, the impacts of uh, bird strike. And of course, then there's the, the challenge of um, fishing displacement as well. Uh, and indeed, we have had instances in the North Sea where uh, marine uh, energy developers have said to us, well, we actually want to build this, uh, this wind farm uh, in the middle of a marine protected area. Um, but don't worry, we've got an idea to, to solve that, which is move the marine protected area and designate another area. Um, and for, for fishing, that means they lose the ground because the, uh, the wind turbines are being built. And then on top of that, um, they're being asked to lose additional ground to a marine protected area. So the fishermen, uh, as they would see it, are paying twice for, for, for this to happen. And what we need to do is to resolve some of those uh, tensions. We may need to designate certain areas as sacrosanct, as fishing grounds uh, that you wouldn't allow uh, wind uh, energy to be developed in, uh, but we, we're increasingly needing to give some thought 
to some of those competing um, uh, sea use uh, choices. So there are issues to resolve. Uh, I'm, I'm not um, finishing on a, on a negative note. I'm just flagging this because I think it's very important that as we roll out uh, on the scale that we intend to, that we don't miss things along the way and that we uh, challenge ourselves to find solutions to these problems along the way. But the opportunities for floating offshore wind in the Celtic Sea are enormous. Uh, I think um, the team have made fantastic progress uh, over the last couple of years in making sure uh, that Wave Hub and the coast off Cornwall is uh, very, very well placed to capitalise on this. Uh, and I'm delighted that we've got the opportunity with G7 here in Cornwall uh, to showcase uh, some of the, the world leading work uh, that we can do in this area. Cornwall was the first part of the UK uh, to deploy uh, onshore wind uh, and uh, we can be a world leader as well when it comes to floating offshore wind. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Secretary of State. We know it's a, a very busy uh, weekend for you and, and we very much appreciate your time. Um, and I think, I think your points uh, were well made. Uh, I, um, I think uh, as, a, as a group uh, of developers and, and public sector and regulators, we're well, a great opportunity to work together to make sure that we can really maximise the opportunity um, as we move forward. So, so thank you very much. Um, so um, we have on the stage now uh, Steve Jeremy, who is the chair um, of uh, Wave Up Development Services, um, now known as Celtic Sea Power, or, um, as, of, as of today, Steve? As of today, yes. Um, who is going to um, talk to us a little bit about the green transition and how uh, floating offshore wind has the potential to meet the scale uh, required to make a significant change. So, uh, Steve, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let's wait for the team to bring the slides up. Um, I thought I'd start with a quote. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. I wonder if in 1859 when Charles Darwin wrote those, Charles Dickens I should say, wrote those words, whether he worked out how they would resonate down through the uh, centuries. Um, I think he probably did, but they certainly resonate with me and certainly with those of us in the offshore renewable sector. Uh, we're in an extraordinary time. We're in a, a battle, I'd like to think about it, as an ex-military man uh, against climate change, but for energy transition, and I think that's a really uh, important distinction. Uh, my job, and it's a pleasure as well, uh, this morning is to uh, give you a feel for what it's like on that front line. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the essential uh, context, the energy context. I want to talk a little bit about why we think floating offshore wind is such a distinctive tool uh, in our armory. And I want to talk a little bit as well about how uh, we wish to accelerate industrialization of floating offshore wind, this fascinating technology. There's the structure of what I'll talk about. Um, uh, it's an, a terrific opportunity as well to set the scene for some really, really um, good speakers. Uh, and thank you to those speakers for coming, but also thank you for everybody coming down uh, as far away as Wales. And uh, for those of you who notice, I've actually got a Cornish Welsh uh, pin just to remind people this is a Celtic Sea opportunity, not just a Cornish opportunity. And thank you as well to all the uh, those watching us on a streaming um, opportunity uh, as we sit here on the G7 stage. Um, we're Cornish, uh, we're passionate uh, people, so we're also, I uh, have an opinion, or three, or four, or five, and so I am going to just challenge some of those classic assumptions that we tend to make. I'm going to challenge the idea that climate change is the only imminent uh, grand challenge. I'm going to challenge the idea that actually uh, green technologies are cheap because of uh, economic um, uh, evolution. And I'm going to challenge the idea that the oil and gas companies are our enemies because I think it's slightly different. I'll talk for about 15 minutes uh, and then when I've finished, uh, there'll be a short time for questions. Um, so without further ado, um, let me run into the energy context. Um, uh, what you're seeing in the pie diagram there is a sense of what the overall energy use is. You'll see that broadly speaking, 80% of the current energy supplies in the world come from fossil fuels. That's a huge figure. And you can see the sense of the scale of the transition in front of us. Uh, and if you look as well, you'll see about where we are with renewals. It's roughly speaking 10%. And of that 10%, a 
around about 5 to 6% is hydroelectricity. So you can see that we're about 4% in offshore wind, solar, and all those other, other things. Um, that is a very, very big uh, challenge ahead of us. Um, you can see as well on the right-hand uh, uh, bar graph, uh, you can see uh, a sense of what the scale of that energy use is. And I want you just to keep in your minds the shape of that curve. Um, I've got in the audience some very um, uh, clever, I've got two professors at least, who will know the mathematics probably underlying this. Uh, but it's not a bell curve, it's actually a first derivative of a logistics curve. Um, now a bit of audience participation. Um, four men, um, on the left, Hubbard King, on the right, um, Colin Campbell, Jean Laha, and then over E.F. E e Schumacher. Can I just have a show of hands about anybody, any, if anybody has heard of uh, any of these people? Two, thank you, <laughs> or might even be three. Some of the greatest energy thinkers of the 20th century, and yet hardly anybody knows about it. Um, why is it important? Uh, it's important for this reason. Um, they predicted, and indeed, uh, Hubbard King is a geologist, or was a geologist, worked for BP, an American man. He predicted that American oil supplies would peak in 1956. He predicted they'd peak in 71, and they did. He, he predicted as well that global energy supplies from oil would peak in around about the 2005 and 2010 time. And if you look at it, it has. So in other words, peak oil, which is what they were talking about and what, what is described and how they work it, is what that red line looks like on that graph. And what you can see in blue, that's the theoretical red line. What you can see in blue is what, what's actually happening. So you can see how it's trending. It's very interesting that the, uh, if you look at the overall use of oil in the last uh, four to five years and the climate emissions in the last four to five years, it has leveled a bit. In my view, it's leveled a bit not because of policy initiatives, but rather because we're running out. So we're running out, and uh, what you've got to think about is how we, uh, in this uh, energy sector, uh, fill the gap on the right-hand side of that graph as the oil supplies begin to run out. Let's just move on. Uh, what's very interesting, because there's a good side of this story, the good side of the story is that it's going to be very helpful for climate change uh, as we run out of oil. Uh, the bad side is, that, of course, we've got a challenge because at the moment oil is pretty critical to what we do in my sector and more about that. So that's a challenge um, and it's a challenge which I think we've got some of the tools to face but let's not, um, let's not under, let's not under, under um, sell the issue of scale and speed that we're confronted with. Um, let me then move on to uh, floating offshore wind. Um, I think it's a very distinctive um, technology. Uh, I've been working in the sector for, for over a decade now. Um, I've got a marine background, uh, but it's been a fascinating and fun sector to work in. Wave energy, tidal energy, floating offshore wind. Um, and it's something that we do particularly well here in Cornwall, albeit we've rather hidden our light under the bushel. Um, this is a little bit of work just to give you an idea as well of the scale of what it is that we're seeking. It's a bit of work we did. Um, we've got two of the local enterprise partnership here with me, which is terrific. Uh, we did some work a couple of years ago on zero carbon Cornwall, about what that might look like, uh, and started to think about how we would do this transition. We were focusing on power, that's electricity, uh, heat and transport. And what's interesting is this which is if you look at that bar graph, people tend to think we're decarbonising the electricity system, but they forget we're actually decarbonising the energy system, which underpins all of those things. So what we've managed to achieve in 30 years and what is pretty advanced county, I would say, in terms of renewables, is the right hand of those, of those figures. We've actually managed to get about 10% of the way there in 30 years. And again, you can just see, this is a pretty advanced uh, county, I would say, but again, it gives you a sense of the scale of what it is that we're facing. So, why flow and what does flow bring to the party? Um, we've got in the audience both um, James Brown from Hexcom. Can't see you, James. You'll be here somewhere. Um, and James's technologies, technologies on the right-hand side, but also you can see um, the um, uh, some of the strengths that I think are here in floating offshore wind. Why is it different? Uh, well, firstly, we can mass produce the floaters. So rather than, than the, what we currently do, which is to uh, fine tune the platforms to put in the seafloor, we can mass produce these because the sea is the sea is the sea. Uh, we can construct them in sheltered waters. Why does that matter? It matters because if we're using large um, DP vessels, dynamic positioning vessels, or jack-up barges offshore, the installation costs or the, the hiring costs around about 350,000 to 500,000 a day. 
So it gives you a sense of what's happening offshore. Whereas if we can do this close to shore or onshore and then tow them uh, away, you can see that actually we can save a lot, of, a lot of costs and we can also reduce the weather risks. We can take the biggest turbines. So there, I think, James, I think you're thinking about two times 10 megawatt turbines. Two times 10, 10 megawatt turbines. Uh, George referred to um, the Delabol, which is the first offshore, uh, first onshore wind farm. It's in this county. Uh, its first deployment, I think, was about 4.5 megawatts. It's now been uprated to nine megawatts. So in other words, that's a wind farm, the first in the country. Uh, and with one of those platforms, we'll put in double the capacity, one single platform. That's the issue in terms of scale. So that's the point I really wanted to make there. We can also access the best wind resources in the deepest waters. Generally speaking, um, I once had a degree in oceanography. I suppose I still do, but I can't remember much of it. But what I can tell you is that the, the, the best wind resources are out to the west of the UK and to the north of the UK. So some of the best resources in, in the UK are actually in the southwest approaches. Probably the best are in Scotland, although it's very demanding, but probably the second best are there. Um, and the last is that last of those bullet points is the p potential for building at scale and speed in the event, in the light of this energy transition. Um, for those of you with technical background, then uh, what we're getting, or what the High Wind pl uh, uh, project, which is a floating offshore wind project up in Scotland, is getting, is a capacity factor of uh, it's actually I've put there 58%. It's actually up at 63%. That's an extraordinary figure. I won't tell you about the mathematics of it. But it's simple to say that we're getting much higher yields from those projects than we're getting from the other projects uh, and also from the onshore wind projects for technical factors. But it's a very exciting factor for us. Uh, and we're looking at levelised cost of energy of uh, 40 to 50 euros a megawatt hour. That's been predicted by Equinor, um, the um, Norwegian oil company who actually are in this sector as well. And that's a very low figure and people like I've got Piers Guy, who sits on my board, but is ex fat and full. These are very exciting figures for us because they're extremely com competitively, um, uh, competitive as well. That's, though, the, the thing that I want to leave you with, scale and speed. If you take nothing away from this presentation other than that, it's the need to go at scale and speed and the opportunity that floating offshore wind provides us. Um, let me also just put in one um, of, uh, challenge one of my assumptions. Um, here's some work I've done abroad. Uh, I did a little bit of work up in Sierra Leone on uh, transition, looking at replacing power ships um, powered by diesel uh, with ocean thermal energy capture. Uh, we looked as well in um, the use of tidal energy uh, capacity in Mozambique and helping with their, uh, re not replace, but sort of supplement the hydroelectric dams. And last but not least, I know that James is looking down in Africa, uh, in Southern Africa, which got a fantastic opportunity in terms of floating offshore wind. But here's the killer. At the moment, we can't do this without diesel. And anybody who tells you that they can doesn't understand what the supply chain is that we're working with. It's there in almost all of the solar, solar uh, panel is, has a diesel in the supply chain, and it's there for us. So not only are we trying to actually do this transition, we're trying to do it while we're getting off uh, diesel uh, and uh, transitioning to something that is other than diesel. Uh, of the um, maritime sector, I should think about 95% plus is still diesel powered. Think about the JCPs around the country. Think about the tractors around the country. I don't know if there's any, if there are any non-diesel tractors, tractors in Cornwall, but I doubt it. Uh, although we are starting to do work with a lovely little company called Bannerman, who actually starting to use cow slurry to produce a diesel-like uh, substitute. But for the moment, uh, the reason that this race is a real race is that when that diesel's gone, if we haven't transitioned from it, we're not going to be able to do a renewable energy transition. So um, let's talk about what we're trying to do here. Uh, we're taking action here. Um, and it's about accelerating this floating offshore wind industrialization. Firstly, uh, we've got a clear strategy. Uh, it started about two and a half years ago, and I'm pleased to say George was part of that, helping us, policy engagement, so that we could start to work out and get the levers we needed to actually um, do some of the things we needed to do. The second was market creation, which we've been running for about the last 18 months. That's been pretty successful. Uh, as George has mentioned, we have a CFD, uh, con contracts for different subsidy regime. Uh, and we also have a project pipeline, and you'll hear a bit more about that. But the first part of the project pipeline, of course, here in the Celtic Sea is the Wayfund project, uh, which looks to be up and running. So thank you, James, and thank you, um, Marion from Bechtel for that. It's terrific news for us. Um, and the next bit of it is really to supply chain in hearts and see what we can do to front load the investment in the supply chain. 
And if we can do that front load investment in the supply chain, then we think we can pick up as much work as possible, which also is good for carbon, because it means that we won't be import, importing stuff, for example, from across China, uh, and eight, eight or 10 or 12,000 miles of diesel used in that trip. So that's the way that we're thinking about it. Um, we've got a terrific opportunity out there in the Celtic Sea. Those regions that you're looking at on that chart, and you'll see that I'm mariner because I don't say map. It's a chart for mariners. But those regions, uh, we think there's somewhere north of 100 gigawatts. And uh, just uh, bear in mind that when Britain is using, is at max power on the grid, it's about 43 gigawatts. So there's somewhere north of there, 100 gigawatts, and gives you a sense of the scale of, of the opportunity out there. Uh, we've also got a great supply chain. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. But in the room, we've got representatives from Wales. Um, there's a great supply chain in the southwest. So between us, those of us in this region, I think, have a terrific opportunity. We're great here at offshore renewables. Um, there's a broader supply chain out in the southwest. So, for example, autonomous vehicles and composites in the southwest. And last but by no means least, heavy industry in Wales, which has got a great South Wales industrial cluster uh, and lots of potential there. So there's outstanding supply chain potential. Uh, what do we want to do? We want to go faster offshore. Uh, we'll hear a little bit about, more about that. It takes eight to nine years at the moment to get a wind farm into the water. Could we get that down in four years? I don't know, but I think we should try. And I think we can think about ways of doing it. If you look at the chart there, uh, it's from a Scottish uh, publication, but it's all of the things that we have to go through. Uh, about how we get an offshore wind farm in the water, and it's long and complicated. I won't bore you with it. Um, but um, Piers and I have had conversations about how the Oil and Gas Authority do it, do it, and it's much more efficient as far as we can see. And if we could go faster, then we can realise this opportunity more quickly. Uh, regional working. Uh, we'd like to see at the moment we have national institutions uh, who are critical to what we do. So we have Bayes, the Crown Estate and the MMO all tend to work nationally. So when we're working with the, with the MMO, and I've got to be careful what I say here because George owns them, but their head office is actually in Newcastle. Uh, and because I have a strong view that actually it's in the region that we really know. We understand our waters, we understand our supply chain, and we understand what we need to do. So it's trying to work out how if we can do something like, for example, what they did uh, with the vaccine task force, business-led, but actually integrating teams and actually taking risks from time to time, we think we can go quicker. And I honestly do believe that four, four, four years is possible. Uh, we also want to um, see what we can do with the, um, the supply chain itself. So we want to grow this supply chain. Um, on the left of the diagram, as you look at it, there are some of the supply chain companies. There's AMP in Falmouth, who are represented in the room, and there are other companies as well. On the right, I've just given you some sense of innovation in the county. Um, I'll talk you through those wonderful coloured diagrams in a second. Matt and I are smiling because most of them come for the company that we used to work for. Um, but if you take the top left-hand side, you'll see colour in the middle and essentially what that little bar, that, that little uh, back of the fag packet picture is on the left-hand side is a sketch about how we would actually do a drill, uh, deploy a drill offshore and a, and a German drill. Um, within uh, three months, you'll see the computational fluid dynamics coloured diagram. And on the right-hand side, that's a little person down on the right, the bottom. I think it's about... 70 to 80 feet high, that's built, constructed, and ready to go in the water. It's a drill socket for, a, um, uh, for uh, operations in high-energy tidal sites, which is equivalent to trying to put, um, put a, um, a, a wind turbine up in a gale or a hurricane. Uh, that was done in six months uh, from sketch to build, and that's the potential for the innovation here. You can see a, a wet make connector on the top right-hand side. You can see lifting beckets on uh, a major end tidal turbine. You can see a voice, um, a voice, a lift uh, up in the the um, Orkneys, and then you can see um, a ship on the right hand side, which I worked a long hard at, um, which how to, uh, which is the HF four vessel, working in high energy tidal sites, all designed by Cornish companies and worked with with Cornish companies. So the supply chains here, it's not a question of capability; it's a question of building the scale and capacity to be able to do what needed to be done. Um, let me um, draw now to a conclusion. I'm going to let you just read that first quote. It's one of my favourites. It's from uh, Kenneth Boulding. I would say if there is an enemy in this campaign, it's the economists. I'm sorry if you're an economist, but they are. Um, they, are, they, are they think in a slightly different way. They seem to think that, that, that infinite growth is possible on a finite planet. Those of us who've got a mathematical or a geological or a physics or an engineering background tend to disagree. 
Uh, unfortunately, they've been uh, influential, um, but I think they'll become less influential. Uh, the quote from David Hughes is much more interesting. He's a geoscientist, uh, and I think that he's on to the right thing. I don't think that climate change is the only issue. I think energy transition is probably the more immediate issues. And the good thing is that if we can actually... Uh, the, the policies we need to address one are the same. So actually, I think that we're on the right track. It's just the question of what we've got to do. Um, energy transition. Energy transition is a bit like a tree. And the best place, time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. And the second best time is now. Uh, the best time to have started this energy transition would probably meant 20 or 30 years ago. And the second best time is now. Um, you can see as a consequence of probably not starting when we should have done, we've got a little bit of catching up to do. Um, what are we doing about it in this county? Um, we have a strategy, I think you've seen, and we're executing it. As I say, the time for... Uh, action has passed. So the time for deliberation has passed. We have ambition. Um, George has talked about one gigawatt uh, by 2030. We'd like to do more than that, so I'll try to persuade him and the government to give us a higher ambition. We'd like to have three gigawatts underway in the Celtic Sea by 2030. Um, we'd like as well to work out how we can front load the investment in the supply chain here so that actually we can have British companies doing all the things that they're very good at. Um, I'm sorry if there's a Dane in the audience or any Danish in the audience, but a Danish colleague once said to me, we stole the offshore wind industry from you. We'd like to steal it back. Thanks. Um, so let me just come finally to a close. Um, the strategy that we're executing is our strategy. That reminds me, when you're uh, a CEO of a warship and you take over that warship for the first time, you have something called clear lower deck. That clear lower deck is standing in front of your people and uh, talking to them and really setting out your... your um, your agenda for the next two years of that command. There's a famous story where a captain stood in front of his uh, team. He said, I want this ship to be not my ship, not your ship, but our ship. And from the back was heard, oh good, let's sell it. The, um, uh, we don't want to sell this strategy though, it is our strategy and I genuinely mean that. That's why we've got people from across the region. Um, so let me just conclude. Um, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It's worst in terms of the challenge that we face. It is an extraordinary challenge, and I think it is the millennial challenge of our times. But I can't think of a better team <laughs> in terms of how we've got around this audience and, uh, and the supply chain that Matt and I work with to take forward that task. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Don't go anywhere. Stay there. <laughs> OK, you're not off the hook yet. OK, so for our online audience, um, if you would like to uh, make any comments or ask any questions, um, if you click on the Q&A button on the webinar, you should be able to uh, type something in and I should be able to get them out to you. So um, um, don't be shy. Uh, also, um, we're happy to accept comments and I'm also happy, they don't know this yet, but I'm also happy to pose questions of our audience. So um, <laughs> let's, let's see what we get through. Um, we have got some time for questions. Um, I'd like to kick off, um, if I may, Steve, by asking one on my own, because I'm, I'm, I've got the microphone, so uh, <laughs> I have the power. We, we've talked about flow industrialisation, and you, you touched on it, but what would you say are the big challenges that, um, that, that need addressing? Um, I think it's about two things. It's about production engineering, about which you and I have talked at length, and I think it's about offshore operations. Um, I don't think I've seen anywhere anybody who knows how to put a 300 megawatt wind farm uh, like this in the water. It's a slightly different process, and I think that we've got to think about, for example, um, if you're talking about a 300 megawatt wind farm, that might be three anchors per device, it might be six anchors per device, so it could be as many as, um, what's that, you know, 300 plus anchors uh, over a season or two seasons. That's drilling offshore in difficult weather. How do we do that? How do we um, do things such as, um, do, we, do we construct these alongside? I think we probably do. Um, do we construct them using jack-up barges in Carrick Roads or in Milford Haven? Possibly, I don't know. Uh, but how do we do that in a production engineering way? Uh, and then when we've got it offshore, and it will be offshore at depth because everything is further out, so it's going to be much further from shore. How do we maintain it? Is it going to be using service operations vessels? Is it going to be using crew transfer vessels, small vessels at speed? Because I can tell you by the time you've been out in the southwest approach at 30 knots to get out there in a fourth, five or six, 
you won't be much use on that wind turbine. Um, is it going to be using helicopters, which is an area that I'm interested in? Uh, I don't think we know the answer to that. And should we be bringing these things back to maintain them um, back in uh, Milford Haven or Carrick Roads uh, in Falmouth? Or should we be trying to maintain them out there? People don't know. I've got strong views on that, but we don't really know the answers until we've got going, I think. Um, so those are the big challenges. It's the industrialisation challenge. OK, thanks very much, Steve. Um, is, is there anybody in the audience who'd like to make a comment on that? Or um, has anybody got a question they'd like to ask Steve? OK, so... Um, Simon Cheeseman, what we're going to do um, for those online, there is a socially distant microphone on a stick, which is now being waved <laughs> in front of the face of the, uh, of, of the audience member. If you could just let us know who you are, uh, which company, and, uh, and fire away, and uh, that would be, that'd be great. OK, thanks very much, Matt. Uh, my name's Simon Cheeseman. I work for the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult, and we're based down here in Cornwall. Um, Steve, thanks for a great presentation. I wondered if you wanted to touch on some of the wider economic benefits of the Celtic Sea, and you and I both sit on the um, Celtic Sea Alliance, and you know look at that sort of Irish connection as well, and you know the, the, the huge economic benefits that we can probably draw for by collaboration and working together at looking at deployment across the um, across the Celtic Sea. Yeah, yeah, I'd be delighted. I mean. Um I'm a, I'm a mariner, Matt's a mariner, you and I have talked, you're an engineer, Simon, we've talked about this a lot. We don't think there is one single port solution, uh, we don't think there is a, so this is a collaborative um, thing. I think that we, the, there are obvious opportunities here, I'm going to, I don't know whether Michael Warner, who's going to talk later, will say this, but essentially when you're building these things structurally, so one of those great big floating offshore wind turbines, I, I say that if I'm using something like a, Principal power foundation, it's about 10,000 tonnes, which I would say is a, a, the size of two destroyers. Matt says it's a small merchant vessel, but there we are. Um, but actually, it's big. Uh, and if you're building 50 of those, uh, think of that in terms of UK shipbuilding and in terms of UK national shipbuilding. So there's a huge opportunity there. So there's yards, but I think the issue is how we get the supply chain. And I don't think there's a supply chain anywhere in the world which is ready for this. But whether or not we can front load investment in this supply chain, uh, which would allow us to get the supply chain ready ahead of time. And you'll hear a lot more about that from Michael Warner, for whom this, who's an expert here of that. But if we can do that, I can't think where we can't pick up the content, and we should. It'll be lower in terms of carbon, because we'll be uh, importing stuff from, f from less further afield, and better for the economy. At the moment, I think we have 42% UK content in our offshore wind farms. Uh, government target is 60% and we'd like to have a really good go at that and we think we can. Thanks very much, Steve. We, we have got some uh, questions from our online audience, so thank you very much. Um, uh, this one is from Will Rowley. Um, whilst we are tackling the industrial aspect, are we confident that the necessary support to bring uh, necessary insurers and finances along is also being addressed locally, regionally and via central government? Um, that's, that's a, a difficult question. It's a sophisticated question, and it it's happens to be, fortunately, it's a subject that Matt and I have talked about at some length. <laughs> um, but I think there's work to do on this, and, and I'm going to be shamelessly um, say uh, some of the things that Matt's told me and with, with which I agree. I think there's a lot of old thinking in, in offshore wing contracting. Uh, so not, not old thinking is the wrong word, conventional thinking in offshore wind contracting. Uh, and I remember conversations with colleagues back in um, the small company that which we worked for, which was about thinking about contracting and commercial stuff in a much more collaborative way. And I think there are ways to do this where actually we're not in uh, battles uh, between each other on the basis of contract points, but rather we've set up much more com commercial things which everybody benefits if we're successful. So I do think there are going to be ways to do that differently. Uh, um, in direct answer to the question, are we there with that? No, we're not. I don't think, Matt. I think there's a long way to go. But we certainly have it on our radar as something that we need to, to address. Thank you, Steve. Have I got any other final points? Uh, James. Here comes the uh, here comes the stick. <laughs> so James Brown, managing director of Twin Hub, who who recently agreed to acquire the the Wave Hub site. I think the the first thing overall for us is we're, we're thrilled about this opportunity and thank you and your teams for putting it forward to the to the market. Um, I think it's a balanced uh, in the sense that we 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 see it as a huge opportunity, but we think we can contribute a lot to the to the local development. Um, my, my question is a, a little bit about the power to X side of the equation. Mm -hmm. And obviously our, our first project here um, is, is very well structured 
and introducing 30 to 40 megawatts into the grid, I you've already laid down the infrastructure, the grid connection's there, the, the grid can take it. As we increase in project size, uh, where the output's going to increase. The Crown Estate is talking about 300 megawatts in the Celtic Sea. Um, that starts to be a little bit more important in how you get that in. But ultimately, the, to fulfill the obligations in net zero, we're talking about much larger numbers into the grid. Mm. How can Cornwall, what can Cornwall do to absorb this kind of power capacity knowing that uh, demand centers are, are obviously further east, further north? Mm. Um, it's, a, it's a subject, James, that we have looked at. Um, we've had a grid study commissioned, um, and we've still work to do on that. Um, in terms of strategically, we're floating offshore, and there is no perfect place to do this, uh, because the grid in the three locations where you can take the power shore, that's South Wales, uh, Cornwall, and Scotland, is not ready to take it, because uh, the distance between where, we, where the, the resource is and where the demand centres is significant. Uh, when it comes to uh, investment, then there will this is critical national infrastructure, and there will need to have national investment. Um, but as I say, it's critical national infrastructure. Interestingly, from what we can see from that study, um, the South West and Wales is an easier ask in terms of national investment because of the, um, the, the shorter distance between us and the load centres. Um, there is work to do on that. Uh, we're also though, um, thinking a little bit more uh, differently. So for example, uh, we've had conversations with Cornwall Lithium, uh, who are setting up here on British Lithium. Uh, they have significant power requirements uh, and it's by no means impossible that there's a match to be had there between their power requirements in delivering lithium and our uh, desire to not to wash our hands of the power when we bring it ashore. So the short answer is that, yeah, we can take uh, the power that you'll be able to provide into the, into, the, into the grid, James, but there's a bit of a way to go before we've actually got um, the answer in terms of power to X. But it's something that we're acutely conscious of, and you'll have seen that grid investment was on my slides as one of the things that we're looking at. Thank you very much, Steve. I'm just going to um, pick up a couple of the online audience questions. I think um, uh, Mike Reynolds asked what scale of grid infrastructure is required and are the companies represented at this conference. I, th I think probably the answer you've just given, Steve, is uh, along those lines, but we can, um, we, we can sort of pick that up with you, Mike, um, after the event in a little bit more detail. Um, uh, I've just got a couple uh, here. Shane Carr, um, who owns TugDoc, um, just wanted to... Um, give us the news that they've just um they have an order and they're working on the next flow project so another another cornish company that's really innovated um hard and in fact uh, during the break you'll see a video which actually f um includes uh, tug doc so um i thought that would be uh, a good thing to raise and, and and let everybody know who's in the room uh peter davis um that's an excellent question i i'm gonna we're running out of time unfortunately but i will hold that over i think for someone else um I am looking around the audience to see who's going to get it. So uh, um, better be nice to me uh, during the break, otherwise that's coming your way. Um, but I'd like to finish off just from Steve Hall. Steve Hall is a colleague, um, 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 Chief Executive of Marine Energy Wales, with whom um, we in Cornwall are working really, really closely with. Um, comment for you, Steve. Excellent presentation. Thanks for the mentions of all the partners in the Celtic Sea region and looking forward to working with us all through the Celtic Sea Alliance for Developers and the Coast Sea Cluster for Supply Chain. So um, I, I never think it's a, a bad thing to finish with a massive pat on the back. So um, thank you very much. So uh, thanks again, Steve. And um, uh, OK, fantastic. So there's a, a very, very short delay. I'm not sure how much can be seen online, but we are sanitizing the lectern to make sure it's nice and clean. If you want to feel more part of the event, please feel free to sanitise your screen at the same time. We'll be doing it between every speaker. OK, perfect. So I think we're ready. I'd like now to welcome to the stage Adrian Schultz, who's the Head of Renewables for KPMG in the UK. Um, fascinating presentation coming on uh, the global market context, uh, size and importance of the UK market to the world. Adrian, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Matt. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Adrian Schultz. Uh, as Matt said, I'm a partner at KPMG, focusing on the energy sector, in particular renewable energy. Um, thank you so much for inviting me here today. I mean, it's an absolute pleasure to be presenting to you today. Um, we've already heard some fantastic insights 
on the techni technological aspects, the supply chain aspects of flow. And that's really, you know, that's really critical to get flow going and to bring down LCOE of flow. But I've been asked here today because really I spend all of my time working with the big developers, the big financiers of uh, the major renewables projects and hopefully much more with flow projects to talk about really global market perspectives and then the UK within it and hopefully bringing it back to the Celtic Sea as well at the end. The slides up. Fantastic. Thank you. So first of all, just, um, just very quickly on myself, been working 20 years in, in the renewable space. Uh, advised on deals with a, with a capital value of more than $30 billion, probably more than 20 offshore wind farms. Um, um, but, um, but most interestingly, perhaps, uh, I spent a few years down, down here in Cornwall running a, a small renewables advisory business, working with many of the key stakeholders uh, in, in Cornwall. And, you know, for me personally, it's fantastic to come back here. So, so thank you again for this uh, invitation. I mean, specifically in the last 18 months, uh, also been working with... Cornwall County Council and the Wave Hub team running the process. It was a global process. There was wide ranging interest from many different parties to find a new owner for the Wave Hub project. And it's fantastic that this concluded you know, just, just in, in, in the recent months um, with, with Hexacon acquiring the project. So it's a really strong future for the project. Um, I've worked with clients right around the world, Japanese, Chinese clients, uh, European utilities, and then a number of the major US investors and oil and gas companies that, you know, all the oil and gas companies are now on the energy transition. So let's start with the forecasts. What do we think will be achieved by 2030? Well, I think you know, Bloomberg is about as good a, and as a credible forecast that you can get of, of what the future looks like. You know, I think inevitably it's going to be a big, it is a big hockey stick that really kicks up after 2025. But let's just be clear, if there are going to be six gigawatts of installations by 20, 2030, you know, coming through between 2028 and 2030, those are projects that are coming into operation. So those capital decisions are being made two to three years before. The key decisions around procurement, revenue stream, bringing the whole project up to the capital decision are several years before that. So to achieve six gigawatts by 2030, you know, these need to be projects that are well in development and not just in development, but making strong progress through development so they can get to uh, those final investment decisions you know, early post 2025. I've actually seen many more. Uh, you know, Bloomberg, is, Bloomberg is, is, is an excellent forecaster, but you know, I've seen very wide ranging forecasts. I've seen numbers that could be well below three gigawatts, but also actually there's a much larger number of projects already in active development. I mean, a gross, a gross number of projects of close to 20 gigawatts, I would say, are in active to development. So if the regulation allowed, if the supply chain and technology allowed, um, they could in theory be in operation by 2030. But the biggest drive of this, of course, is getting LCOE, LCOE down. Um, you know, the UK was fantastic in creating the glide path together with a few other markets north, in Northwest Europe around offshore wind. It supported offshore wind with those early subsidies, fixed, fixed bottom offshore wind, with those early subsidies of you know, 150, 190 euros a megawatt hour in Germany, CFD prices that were 140 pounds with renewable ob obligation certificates be before that, generating attractive subsidies. You know, that's helped to, to set in an industry, uh, implement and industrialize and build a scale industry that, I mean, I, I would possibly guess that the next CFD round four for offshore wind could start with the two. And that's not 200, it's 20 something pounds per megawatt hour. So you're actually moving to decisions now whether, uh, maybe this is slightly controversial, it's just personal views, of course, but you're moving to decisions now, do I actually need a CFD um, or do I mix a CFD with different types of revenue streams? I think the CFD is still required, but it's about mixing it potentially um, because offshore wind is really starting to play in, in, in the competitive market from, from a ground-mounted perspective. So it's about all about how that is achieved from, from a, a flow perspective.
So within Bloomberg's target to 2030, six, just over six gigawatts, you know, we saw in the previous page, we can see in the stack for 2030, on the left-hand side of the page, that uh, Korea is the largest market. I'll talk about overseas markets in a few moments, but the UK is about 1.3 gigawatts. Within that, there are defined projects that are in planning. But I think the key message is that, you know, Scotland has really uh, the dominant region for flow at the moment in terms of defined projects um, and in terms of having a leasing round that is actually supporting to create more projects coming through. So Scotwind is, uh, I would say, it is a highly successful leasing mechanism that is stimulating floating offshore wind at scale. But we'll really see how it comes through in the next few months. It's getting to the sharp end now, where in July, um, actually, the, the auction bids process will commence, and then we'll see the real projects coming through. Um, but but the, shortlisted, um, the shortlisted developers have all been announced, and they know who they are. So strong progress and momentum in Scotland. But looking beyond 2050, Bloomberg doesn't go beyond 20, sorry, look, going beyond 2030, Bloomberg doesn't have a forecast. So I've turned to another forecaster, uh, OREC, we've got a member of OREC here in the room. I mean, OREC is a fantastic uh, organization that is really focusing on the glide path of stimulating uh, offshore wind, floating offshore wind, and you know, not just beating the drum that we need more of it, but actually really that focusing on bringing down LCOE. I mean, the message is consistent before to Bloomberg, but, but on a much bigger scale. Yeah, the obvious first point is that there is an enormous opportunity generically. But I think the message is for floating offshore wind is really different to ground-mounted offshore wind. This is an industry that will become, is becoming much more global, much more quickly than fixed-mounted offshore wind. Fixed mounted offshore wind started with, we'll make a decision, should we go to Germany or should we go to, to the UK because that's where the support is? Or are we a local developer in the Benelux or, or in Denmark? Uh, and then maybe you went to another market and another market, one by one. Um, but flow is completely different. So therefore it's driving business models that are completely different. Apart from the detail and the technical sides of supply chain nuances, is the technology there, is it coming through? This is all about business models. The big developers of flow are setting themselves up differently. They're setting themselves up on a global basis. They're literally navigating globally and seeing which markets do we go to at what, what point in time and being set up to actually go into those markets really quickly if they are attractive or set the right opportunity and conditions for, for, for to develop projects and for their risk appetite. Um, so it is less step by step, but rather setting up to monitor literally the global opportunity and then go to where much more efficiently and, and flexibly go to where the opportunities lie. So that just bringing that back to the UK or back to the Celtic Sea, we just need to be mindful that that's, that's where we sit. We sit within that kind of global landscape um, uh, at the moment with flow which is different to um, with the legacy, with the history of fixed, fixed offshore wind. Also, the fact that you can see here at the bottom half of the, of the slide, you know, the US, Japan, there is a lot of development going on in the US and Japan at the moment. Bloomberg does it, it doesn't really feature in Bloomberg to 2030, but it's coming through after 2030. These are the two really large standout individual flow markets in the, in the long term. And that infrastructure is being built now in those markets. So just, I wanted to just move it forward and build on that theme about business models and, and navigating the, 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 the global market, so to speak, to choose where, where you play uh, as a developer. Where do you really put, put your development bucks into developing projects and trying to drive them forward and building the stakeholders uh, to succeed in your projects. I mean, there are effectively a set of global themes and the big developers, be they oil and gas companies, the legacy major utilities, entrepreneurial organisations or independent developers or technology companies, they're looking at the same set of themes across these markets 
and they're trying to drive their dis these decisions. So firstly, just going around the chart, you know, what are the macro characteristics? Is this an attractive market for me? Do I understand the risks? Has there been a track record of delivering projects? That, that naturally builds early confidence and, um, and, and can be, you know, drive a, a natural focus area. But then you move it into the individual country itself, which is, you know, what is the approach to direct level of control? If I'm coming as a, as a truly international company, like an oil and gas company, or like some of the, you know, the, the major utilities that are setting themselves up to be much more international now, much more global, almost becoming more like oil and gas companies in, in the way they behave and make investment decisions. Um, they are, they, 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 they are, you're looking then into a country in the US or in Europe or in Asia and thinking, right, to what extent do I need to partner locally? Do I actually need local representation, not just in the supply chain, but you know, actually in the equity of the project? In order to deliver a project, you know, do I need to have local equity partners? That's alongside having supply chain. And that just all leads to decisions around the value and the commerciality of projects. And each country has real detailed specifics to to, to understand and, 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 and these are you know, meaning, meaningful decisions that, 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 have a big, that have big implications. Then you come into the, the actual sort of what I call the development cycle. You know, every country has different processes, risk, exposure, procedures, regulation around the development milestones. Is the lease uh, almost like a concession type structure where everyone is bidding for the first piece of water, the same piece of water? Um, is it more a case of like the UK where you find your own site or you bid for the lease, then you develop the lease, the site, and then you need to bid for, for the revenue stream? Again, I mean, in, in the UK, one of the challenges that you commonly hear from developers is, you know, they're spending tens of millions of pounds developing before they have any certainty on the revenue structure at all, whereas that would be different if you're bidding a concession. I'm not saying one is right or wrong, but you just have to evaluate that all the time. And again, every country is different. Moving around to point four, again, each market will have its own uh, unique revenue mechanism. Are they, are, are, uh, it, flow clearly still requires subsidy. So you know, it's almost a case of which countries want to be the equivalent of um, Germany and the UK in providing that support to industrialize the market and, and then to get the inevitable LCOE coming down pretty rapidly. And, you know, no one wants to be oversubsidizing, but at the same time, you want to stimulate that market. Um, and and, and, and so, so that's driving each, each individual set of revenue mechanisms by country. And point five is really linked to point four. It's, it's, it's about making that decision to support the glide path of flow to cost competitiveness, getting that LCOE down, showing the same experience that you've had with fixed bottom offshore wind, you know, starting up with revenue streams, 150 pounds per megawatt hour, potentially getting them down into the 20s or 30s. And then finally, you know, what about the sites themselves? How large is the actual market? You know, logically, when you're, get, when you're, when you're behaving as a, as a global developer, looking across the market, there is a certain amount of momentum, risk, investment that's required to go into a new market. So you want to know that market will have good quality projects, and a good pipeline of projects. And it's not just all that effort is going in to deliver one project or two projects. So just moving that forward, I've just had a, you know, a very quick sort of tertiary um, perspective on what that means by country. And I want, I want to be really clear here. It's not a case of one is better than the other. A full pie chart is good, or a full, a full moon is good, and a, 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 a no moon is bad. This is a case of, you know, each country has its mix. Um, so if you look along the first point about macro circumstances, you know, the UK has been very open. But then at the same time, if you look to points two and three, um, it's had a relatively, relatively, I know there were supply chain plans in the CFD, but relatively a much more hands-off approach to, um, to supply chain involvement. Um, whereas if you look across to, certainly across to, to Asia, emerging markets like um, Korea, you know, I'm working with quite a few uh, major European developers who are, who are really 
you know, very keen on Korea. They already have past experiences in some cases with Korea, but the Korean flow market, as we saw in the forecast early on, is a very large market. But to go into Korea, um, you know, partnering will be required, highly likely. If you want to have uh, a grid connection, you'll probably need to have a partnership with the grid operator. They may have equity in the project. Uh, if you want to secure uh, a PPA, you'll have to have a partnership with the generator, with one of the state-owned generators. Will they, have, will they have equity in the project? Possibly they will. So it's going through that dynamic, which is completely different to a leasing process or an auction process for a revenue structure. I'm not saying one is better than the other. Um, you know, Korea is, is really committed. It's made probably the boldest announcements around flow. Um, but there is a certain dynamic that needs to be navigated if, as an international developer, you're going to go and, um, and, and deploy capital and try and develop projects into, into Korea. Um, moving down, you know, again, or trying to bring to life some of the revenue structures and the glide path to flow. I think the reason why a lot of these countries, these are the countries that really are the tier one markets for flow. They're going to have the, the biggest contribution to 2030, but then if they're not yet there by 2030, like the US and Jam, Japan potentially, they'll be coming shortly afterwards. The reason why the moons are quite full there is because they are strongly committed to the sector. That's why they're the tier one countries. And there is an expectation that there will be support coming through in those markets. And again, many of those markets have got you know, a significant amount, 0.6, of, 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 of good quality sites. So they should be strong markets in their own right. So let's bring that back to, to the Celtic Sea. You know, I really just wanted to give that as, as that global context. Um, you know, for me personally, I would love to see the Celtic Sea making strong progress. Um, you know, that's, that's, that goes to my heritage in renewables, you know, the, the fantastic work we, the, the, that I've had the pleasure of doing with, uh, uh, with, with the Wave Hub team in the last 12, 18 months. Um, but just to be clear, you know, there are two main areas for flow in the UK, or, or, or uh, perhaps three as well, the North East to some extent too, I, I don't want to leave them out, but two, two you know, as I, as I see it, two, two main areas. Scotland, which is really driving hard at the moment with projects pre-Scotwind plus Scotwind on top. Um, but then the Celtic Sea, you know, there are, there are some uh, developers that are stimulating projects just um, nascently themselves um, without having a formal leasing round in Ireland, Wales and, and in Cornwall. And you know, OX view is that there is a, a clear potential cap capacity, if I've got my numbers right, at 15 gigawatts plus. Um, but there's, I'm sure, a lot of detail sat behind that and they can, they can build on that. But, but you know, strong direction is required. We need to learn the lessons from the fixed mounted experience from Scotland, from Scotwind and globally. Um, we have a view. Um, Steve, I've tempered my view slightly. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but you know, a clear ambition is required if not three gigawatts by 2030. And that's principally driven by, you know, the timeframes to deliver project that I explained at the start. But nonetheless, two gigawatts operating by 2032 is a clear and bold ambition. Making that announcement as soon as possible is important to set, uh, set, set the direction towards, towards making tangible progress. But then sat behind that, you know, I think we all know the two main kind of areas of direction to deliver behind a target is first of all the leasing rounds, setting up uh, a specific framework of leasing rounds for flow in the Celtic Sea. The suggested action is a first leasing round that is three gigawatt plus, targeting final investment decisions started construction by 2030 to deliver then, or before 2030, 28, 29, 30, to then deliver those projects by 2032 into operation. And you know, setting up to deliver the lead, to actually run the leasing round uh, 2022 into 2023, giving that lead time then to deliver the project. So the leasing round needs to happen soon. And then as the projects are, le are developed, once leases are secured, uh, you know, adapting the CFD framework to achieve the target and then really entrench the supply chain. So setting the CFD rounds that they do achieve the right balance across allocation pot size and, uh, and, and strike price ceiling. 
and, and, and setting those CFD rounds to be run in 2026, 2027. So that's about one to two years prior to final investment decision. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for listening and look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Adrian, that was great. Thank you very much. Um, I think the take home for me is, um, and, and quite often we, you, you can be in a bit of a bubble, can't you, in a, in, in a region. Um, that really brings home the context and the size of the global market and the opportunities that present themselves. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of questions, um, but I've got the lectern and the microphone, so I go first. Um, okay. Just thinking about um, the, the UK and, and, and possibly a little bit beyond um, the developers as well, thinking about the, the wider supply chain, but that's a big export market. So what, what, what can we be doing? What can the UK do, do you think, to, um, to, to really capture a, as much of that as possible? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm drawing on my dialogue mainly with developers when I'm answering this question, big global developers. Um, I think the first point is the supply chain is global and the supply chain will require you know, really strong partnership. So I, I think building that partnership early on with the big developers and then entrenching some of that supply chain into you know, the region is what will help them for, that, for, for, for the supply chain that is entrenched in the region then to work. Remember, it's all about you know, the, the big developers operating globally. They have their supply chain partners to deliver flow and it's then drawing on that supply chain through the partnership that is entrenched already in the region. Okay, excellent. Um, I'm, I'm looking to the room now. I wonder if there's any any comments. Um, I'm going to go with uh, with Ben Gowers at the front. For those online, here comes the microphone on a stick. Stand by. <laughs> Hi, Ben Gowers and Morwind. Adrian, okay. I was really interested in your moon symbols looking across the world. Yes. And with what you've just said, particularly. Would you say those moon symbols might need to be updated, for, particularly for points two and three, if the UK and partly the Southwest wants to achieve what Steve's described with stealing back wind, for instance? Um, and then, how, and, and then interested in your opinion, if we were to adjust those moon symbols to be more in favour of UK bias, how would that look from a, a more financing perspective in the global context? Yeah, so I, th I think your first point is, yes, that's the entire debate. How do we strike the right balance? Um, you know, and, and I don't want to get too nationalist here. You know, I want to be really careful, of course. But, um, um, but, but the UK has been very open. And then on the, on, on the fixed side, you know, we, we could have secured more supply chain. I think everyone agrees to that. Um, so therefore, it's about finding the right balance where we maintain you know, what, we're, what we're famous for and what we're proud of, which is being open and you know, really n n bringing forward the best globally, but, but then trying to entrench that. So you know, it is, it is, you know, there are different aspects of supply chain. There, is, there are British companies and then there are international companies investing into Britain. So it's, it's striking the, the right balance of supporting you know, genuinely British companies but then especially as you get to a larger scale, you know, companies just become global. It just happens to be where their, where, their share, where their shares are listed or where the asset manager that owns them happens to be based. But, you know, genuinely, most, most companies are global, even if they're listed in the UK or not. But, but so it's, it's about nurturing, let's say, UK entrepreneurial companies and private companies, but then also attracting investment into the area from, from large companies, whether they're UK listed or not. They're just making those investment decisions. So, yes, agree. I mean, that's the whole balance of the argument and, you know, it's how far you can go that way. But certainly, if you can increase that moon shading, it, it, it should help. It should help. Then the point to finance. I mean, f f finance genuinely does not need to deploy into the UK. It, it, you know, it just doesn't matter. Yeah. Unless you are the U a UK institution where it's specifically required that you do. But if you are, 
you know, who were, who were the biggest investors in the world into renewables? People like Canada Pension Plan or Macquarie or, you know, or then the big oil and gas companies. I mean, they that the, the emerging coming through, hopefully, or, or the big utilities. I mean, th it doesn't have to be in the UK. So fi finance to me is a misnomer. Finance will go where there are good projects, which goes to all of those different kind of categories, plus everything else that sits behind it. But unless finance has a specific, let's say, a multinational, a, 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 a specific um, angle like it's the Green Investment Bank as it, as it was before, or maybe the National Infrastructure Bank, or it's the EIB or something like that, has a spe specific modus operandi to support uh, an industry. You know, conventional commercial finance will go where the great projects and the great developers and, uh, uh, and follow that globally. So it doesn't really matter. So it's really, I think, to your first point, which is the critical one. Thank you, Adrian. I'm going to put you on the spot now with a, with a question here from uh, Chris Hines, who's online. Um, if you were to bet on actual delivery of this, how confident are you in a percentage basis? So that's quite a broad question. Um, and the sub-question is, what can the public do? The delivery of... Uh, not be specific there, Sorry. but... <laughs> uh, well, the delivery of flow, I mean, I'm, I'm extremely passionate about it and confident because it's happening. Um, you know, the projects are getting developed. Um, I, I, some, I sometimes say that when you see, when you see the effervescence in the sector, uh, I, I, one of the things that I say to clients at the moment is there are more companies or organisations that have a share price story that is predicated on doing stuff in big renewables and flow is a massive part of it in the future than there are projects available, which is just what's driving this kind of... I mean, it's just right across the se sector. I mean, it's all sectors. It's whether you're a major energy user like a Google or an Amazon and they've been really driving the corporate PPA market. You know, they just don't want to put capital into this infrastructure at the moment. That's fine. There are plenty of other people that will put capital into the infrastructure, but they want to be buying energy from you know, renewables. And as part of that, they'd love to be buying it from floating offshore wind. Um, uh, th 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 then you have you know, sources of capital. I talked about some of them, you know, banks, and then you have all the, all the big strategics, oil and gas companies, utilities. So that there are so many organi uh, you know, organizations, companies that want to make this happen. Mm. And that's because you know, we, the consumer, um, are not just saying we want to see things being greener. We're insisting on it. It's driving our, our procurement decisions now, our buying decisions. You know, the, the, the customer, I think, uh, so, so then you bring it back to the public. I think we just have to keep demanding that we want change. Um, and, you know, no one thought that COVID would actually amplify this whole agenda the way it has. And that's fantastic. So it's just keep demanding change and then change will get, get, get driven through. Perfect answer. Yeah. Thank that, you. For, um, that, that was from uh, the questioner as well, who's just said perfect answer. Thank you very much. Um, and, any, any other questions? Christoph, hand up first. Sorry, Marion, I'm coming to you next. Hi. <clears throat> yes, Christoph Howard from Simply Blue. Um, and this is the Catapults report, which says 11 gigawatts by 2050 in the UK. Given that we're talking about 120 gigawatts of offshore wind, does not that seem rather small, given accumulation risks on fixed offshore wind, given that there's all on the right-hand side of the country on, on the east coast and single wind systems? Do you think there is an opportunity for more than 11 gigawatts for floating offshore wind in the UK by 2050? Um, well, personally, certainly, yes. It's just about building the infrastructure behind it. So balancing the power and building the grid to take it off onshore. I think everyone agree whether would, would agree whether it is uh, floating on the West Coast or in Scotland or it is uh, fixed bottom in, on, 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 on the East Coast or in the Liverpool Sea, um, um, the, in the Irish Sea, sorry, off the, liver, off the coast in the North West. Um, the, the, the biggest challenge is to take it, take it onto the grid. So there is a proper strategic grid review that's required and then balancing that power, you know, frankly, when the wind blows uh, as new technologies come through to do that. So um, my personal view is yes, definitely, in short.
Perfect. So Marion had her hand up about a nanosecond after Christoph. Christoph um, is, is a professional uh, question answer, so uh, he's always quick. So uh, Marion, you, you have to just get quicker, I'm afraid. So. I'll work on that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Marion Adav from Bechtel, supporting Hexagon on the Twin Art Project. Um, I've got a question regarding your final slide there. Um, the, one of the things that we're really passionate about is engaging supply chain right from the onset on a project. Um, the CFD framework that you put up there is for 2026, and I want to challenge that mm. uh, and see what are the main constraints for not bringing that forward any sooner. I mean, it's, it's, it's a fair point. I'm probably being too conventional is the short answer, which is I'm almost hardwired to, um, to assuming that a CFD should be within 12 to 20, well, 12 months of FID. But, but you're probably actually right. In, with this technology, um, uh, working around securing certainty over the revenue structure uh, is really important to help you um, bring the project forward. So you're probably right, actually. It should be brought forward. Perfect. Thank actually, you. That, that, that leads on to actually a, a question that's come from online, which I think is, is relevant. And, and, and Marion, you, you, you raised the question about being passionate about the local supply chain. Um, I'm, I'm going to put, put it to you first, but um, I, I'm, I'm not putting you on the spot. Any of the other developers in, in the room, please feel free to answer. But Simon Hindley's asking, as a small engineering consultancy with a lot of great ideas, what's our best route into the supply chain? Sorry. <laughs> Good question. Um, <laughs> definitely be in touch with us at Twin Hub. Um, look us up. We either go through the Wave Hub website or um, the Hexagon website. Uh, you're more than welcome to contact me as well. Um, ask Matt for my details. Um, but I think, in general, I think we need to work on, on establishing a better forum for supply chain, especially down here in this region. Um, but we're definitely tapping up as we're, we're ramping up on the project. We're tapping up the Wave Hub existing relationships as well to make sure that we get out as much as possible. Perfect. Thank you, Marion. I'm, I'm going to put Dave Jones right on the spot there as well. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Uh, David Jones from Blue Gem Wind, developing uh, two floating wind projects in the Celtic Sea. I'd first of all go onto our website and register on our supplies database. I think that's, that's a quick win and, and an easy thing to do. But I guess, you know, from a developer's perspective, really looking forward to the development of the clusters. I think the Celtic Sea cluster will, will play a critical role. Um, you know, just a nod to Simon over there and the work that ORE Catapult do um, in terms of you know investing in supply chain and, and gearing up supply chain as well. It's, it's, it's a really important thing to do, and we need to get a move on. Perfect. Okay, so Simon had his hand up. So um, coming coming to you next. <laughs> yeah. Thanks very much, Matt. And that's, that's just picking up on Simon Henley's point and the point that Dave made. There is a Celtic Sea cluster. Um, it's, it's getting its act together at the moment. It is a collaboration between Welsh Government, um, Cornwall, and um, Wave Energy um, and Marine Energy Wales, uh, with ourselves, Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult, involved. Um, it will be launched formally um, towards the end of the year, but uh, if any companies are interested in that, then do contact me, and uh, we can have that discussion. We'll be working with the, the developers, as well as the other um, sort of supply chain clusters that are in the area. Thanks very much, Simon. Okay, uh, Dan Finch, OW Energy. Hi, my name's Dan Finch. I'm the Managing Director of Ocean Wind. Um, we are a fairly major offshore wind developer. Um, we also own a technology, along with our partners, PPI. Um, but what I would say is we're not completely wedded to just one technology. We are interested in improving the sector. We've worked in uh, fixed and, and uh, fixed structures using monopiles and uh, jackets. We've looked at gravity bases and so on, and we still see that there's a development to happen in, in floating. Um, we appear in all of the markets that are there, including our um, shareholder parent, who is Chinese. So we're involved in all of these markets and very, very interested to be very active in Cornwall and the Southwest. Um, what I would suggest is that <coughs> the, the ORE Catapult, of which we are a member and involved in their offshore floating center of excellence, is a good place also to get your ideas involved and to look for funding, which is available from some of the bigger developers um, to improve technologies and to, to drive them forward. Because we've got to reduce the cost base. Yeah. You know, I've been in the industry for nearly 20 years and our recent fixed project is uh, just started generating this week 
and came in at about uh, you know less than uh, fifty percent of the cost of a project that we would have started four or five years ago. So the cost reduction has been dramatic. Yeah, yeah, it's great. That, that's, that, thank you very much. Thank you very much for everyone from the audience for and and uh, yep, putting you all on the spot there. So so thank you very much for your fast feet. Excellent job. Um, so uh, Adrian, just to sum up, I'm hearing huge export market, um, massive opportunities, plenty of investment. We've got developers and a market ready to go with the local supply chain. Can't fail, can we? Let's get on with it. Yep. Perfect. Thank okay. you. Uh, thank, thank you very you much, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So um, whilst we are um, sanitising, and I hope everybody is sanitising their screens at home, better safe than sorry, um, we have got some questions. Um, we have still got some questions that are, that are building up here. Apologies if I haven't answered those yet. We will, we will try and get to them through the day. Um, some of them fit, uh, fit well with, with speakers to come. So, so um, uh, apologies if I've not answered your question yet. I, I will try and get to it. Um, okay, so um, I would love to welcome to the stage uh, Tim Stiven of the Crown Estate, um, who is going to talk through the Crown Estate view of Celtic Sea as a development zone for floating offshore wind. Tim, I know everyone's looking forward to this. So. Thanks, Matt. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, just a, a, a quick personal reflection. It was, um, I felt a real sense of excitement about the answers to that last question. I've, I've worked in the supply chain for uh, offshore renewables. Um, and to see the developers kind of create such a strong pull for small companies um, to find their opportunities, I thought was fantastic. So thank you to the developer community in the audience, because I think that's uh, something new and something very positive. Um, I mentioned I've worked in the offshore supply chain uh, before. It's a pleasure to be back in Falmouth today. Um, I was part of the early push to try and make wave energy work uh, in the southwest here, and the minister's uh, comments about wave hub are, are very interesting. But uh, back at that time, I was uh, working on collaborative R&D and test and demonstration projects with, with Tristan at a &P and with Lars, it's great to see you again uh, at Exeter University. Uh, so just nice to be back in Falmouth uh, and have the opportunity to contribute again to this, uh, this region. So um, I'll not teach you to suck eggs and I'm pretty certain that most people in the audience know who the Crown Estate are and what we do, um, but just very briefly to recap for you. Um, I guess the really vital thing here is that we manage the seabed in England, Wales and Northern Ireland and through two Acts of Parliament in 1961 and 2004, um, we lease or license the seabed for all forms of renewable energy generation. Um, but I think the key point I want to make is that we play a part, along with many others, in having created the world's leading market for offshore wind. And I think the, the measure of that success is that the costs of offshore wind have reduced uh, by 65% since 2015. Um, and you know, that, I think, sets the foundation for floating wind and suggests how uh, we want to go forward uh, to bring a similar success to, the, to this market. Um, the other point I'd make is that the seabed is getting quite busy. Um, and to hit our target for net zero, um, we're going to need to deploy a huge amount of physical infrastructure on the seabed. Um, and of course, we have to uh, consider the environment and the interests of other users of the sea. I'll touch on this later. But it's our job, again, along with others, um, like the MMO um, and other statutory bodies, to balance those interests and come up with a, uh, an optimal answer and a very complex design problem. So let me kind of move you on to something perhaps of more immediate interest, which is you know, what does the Celtic Sea look like from our perspective? Um, what I'm sharing with you here is uh, the results of an assessment uh, analysis that we ran in uh, autumn last year. Um, and uh, we call this our key resource assessment. Um, essentially, what we're trying to do here is understand the technical potential. And we ran this analysis across all of our waters. I've just zoomed in um, to the area of interest, because that's what we're here for. Um, and so, if you like, it, it sort of suggests the outer boundary of what is technically feasible. 
We did this study by taking a look forward on the technology horizon to 2040 and asked the question, you know, what will the turbines look like? What will the foundations be? What will the mooring systems look like? What will the cable technology be? And this work was delivered for us by um, Everos. Um, and we uh, gave the name to the study Broad Horizons, which is available on our website, and I'll share a link. Um, and indeed, the detailed technical reports are also on our marine data exchange. Um, so, kind of so what? I think there are a few key things I'd like to mention here. First of all, if we look across uh, all of the UK's waters, then um, floating wind appears to be technically feasible in over half of the sea space, which is a lot. Um, and clearly in the Celtic Sea, it's quite a bit more than a half, um, because what this is essentially telling you is that once you're over 50 metres water depth, um, and once you're over a <coughs> wind speed of about 10 metres per second at hub height, and frankly, you meet that condition pretty much everywhere, um, then it is technically feasible uh, to deploy floating wind in this region. Um, just to bring it to life for you a bit, the, the, the technology groups are combinations of three factors which really drive the technical feasibility uh, according to our assessment. So those things are uh, the condition of the seabed and essentially the thickness of the, of the sedimentary layers, um, the wave climate and uh, the mooring system and the mooring technologies that you use. And so what we've done to aid analysis is just create six groups of technology and seabed combination and you can see um, what the chart, good point Steve, is trying to tell you, um, is uh, basically how seabed and mooring systems and wave combine and what you would, and therefore what technology solution you would lead with to make that bit of seabed doable. So it's a pretty positive picture and if we get into the detail which isn't for here, it also suggests perhaps some innovation priorities for the region which are distinctive and, and where distinctive strengths can be built. Um, I guess the point I'd make is, is this, this is an engineering assessment, it's, it doesn't uh, take into account commercial viability, that analysis is to come, um, and it doesn't take into account the impacts on the environment and other users of the sea, and that analysis is to come. Um, and the key point of this study, in fact, how we branded the kind of the findings from Broad Horizons was kind of the strap line was, OK, so floating is great. It, it has that kind of Heineken effect. It reaches parts that others can't. Um, but just because it could go everywhere doesn't mean it should go everywhere. But it does unlock that potential to start dealing with some of the tensions uh, and some of the uh, things that are arise in other parts of um, Crown Estate waters. Um, you know, from cumulative impacts on the environment because of the, the amount of infrastructure that's going into the seabed. So the potential is there. And, and what this chart is telling us is that the potential is very strong in this region. But it's also telling us we've got more work to do with the market and with stakeholders to optimise the picture. So if that's what we understand about the region, and you'll have your own understanding, and we need to put those two things together, um, then... I'd also like, just like to share what we, what we have learned from the market. So over the last nine months, um, we have been talking um, a lot informally um, with the developer community, uh, with some investors and with others. And also, uh, we conducted a, a formal market engagement in December to understand um, the picture as well. So I'd just like to, you know, we've listened, we've internalised, we're acting, um, but what did we learn? Well, there's an awful lot of nuance in the long tail of things that we learned, but here are the sort of, there are a handful of very simple things. And the first really simple thing is that there's a very strong case for action by us in respect of making seabed available for the commercialization of floating wind. Um, and the headline there is that basically the market, investors and technology are ready, and I won't dwell on it because you all know it, but it is important that you know that we know it. <laughs> um, Developers expressed a strong preference for the Celtic Sea as an area for early development, or what we call early commercial scale floating wind. Um, there are very good reasons for that. There are other regions of our waters which are promising, like the northeast of England and Northern Ireland, um, but for various reasons, um, those will follow. 
and the judgment is that the Celtic Sea is the right place to start. Um, the next thing we heard from the market is that, uh, to choose Christoph, a term that Christoph uses a lot, a stepping stone is an important part in this journey. Um, and we frame that as being projects of around 300 megawatts in scale, and we call those, in our own world, early commercial. And full commercial is sort of gigawatt plus. Okay, so the next need is a set of early commercial projects. Um, and the key purpose of those projects is to enable supply chain learning and quite specifically local and regional supply chain learning as well as what is required globally. But there should be a local and regional focus. Um, and it's essentially what in my own personal lexicon I call kind of the Goldilocks scale. It's big enough to provide a very robust sort of proof and test that the supply chain is ready to spawn, but it's not so big that it means that activity is forced elsewhere to deliver uh, this early aspiration in the Celtic Sea. And then the last thing I think we heard, and this gets into some of the more nuance and complexity, and I'll try and, I'll try and keep it simple, is that unusually in my, I've been working on technology commercialization and a lot of it offshore for 20 years, and normally your two biggest problems are technology and finance, and the fact that there's a lack of confidence between technology providers and, and investors, and there's, there's the classic valley of death. That isn't the case here, um, and uh, we've been told many times why. So it's an unusual market context because the technology, the combination of technology and investment don't appear to be the constraint. So the things that unlock value, and I'll come back to this on another slide, are the enabling infrastructure of grids, ports, and supply chain. And the opportunities to unlock value sit in those places. And therefore, the way we've internalized that is to say to ourselves, pipeline, pipeline, pipeline. That our next response has to contribute to, because we can't do it alone, there are other parts of the policy landscape. But our response should give as much confidence as possible to the market about this incremental and growing pipeline so that it starts to stimulate some of that investment over the longer term, or that longer term thinking and acting that is needed. So hopefully as we take our next steps and we both speak in public and engage with you in private one-to-one -one and sort of collaboratively in collective forums, you'll start to see our response shaped by what we learned through our market engagement. I'm not going to overlabor this point because actually I think the minister did it brilliantly. Um, he said, we've got to bend the curve on biodiversity loss, ever so simple. Um, we do. Um, so, and I mentioned it at the outset. So we must balance uh, market development. And, you know, the Celtic Sea is an extraordinary place. It's, it has some very rich habitats. Um, it has, you know, to use a, a land-based analogy, you know, the UK's prime real estate for fishing. Um, and people derive important livelihoods from the sea in many ways in this region. Um, one of the less obvious but very important is that there are an awful lot of cables carrying the data that enables our digital economy. Um, so, you know, our response here has to, has to take all of, those, all of those things into account, but I, th I think the point's been made by several people and all I'd say is we support it. So, it kind of brings me on to next step. So what have we, let me just sort of um, kind of review for you and then start to help you sort of look forward if we can. So, um, you know, it is our role to lease the seabed and make it available in support of market development. And, and so that's um, the job we will do, the job we must do. So to sort of review for you where we are with that, um, we're really pleased to have worked hard um, with Steve's team um, and to have been introduced to James recently as um, a new customer of the Crown Estate to, um, you know, facilitate the transition of the leases from um, Cornwall Council to a new owner, which gives a very promising uh, set of circumstances. So it's great to see that. Um, and, and given my personal history, it's great to see WaveHub, um, you know, succeeding in the way that it was intended. Um, 
we have and will, you, will continue to support um, the market at what we call test and demonstration scale and, and Blue Gem Wind. Uh, they're a Rebus project which acquired an agreement for lease from us last October for, for a 96 megawatt project is a good example of that. We hope that there will be uh, some more. And to speak to Dan's point, the purpose of those is that we're aware that there's market appetite for new technology solutions to come in, shall we say, into the post-2030 landscape to support that rapid cost reduction that is required. So we understand the need for that and we'll look to support it. We said in our March announcement that uh, we're minded to bring forward opportunity at 300 megawatts in scale um, for these early commercial projects, and I've explained the rationale for those. Uh, we will do that. Um, our next steps in that will be engagement-led because there are some uh, many questions that we, need, we don't have the answers to, which stakeholders in the market do to get that design right. Um, and then the other thing we're very conscious of is the sense that we must get to full commercial scale as rapidly as we can. But these aren't either, either sort of either or choices, they're and choices. So we want to get to full commercial scale as fast as possible. And we would like to enable opportunity for localities and, and regions and the communities that within, live within them. We'd like to get to full commercial scale and protect and enhance the environment, et cetera, et cetera. I won't, I won't labor the point. Um, and with that in mind, as we look at our role sort of beyond leasing and how we contribute to the prosperity of the UK and its regions more widely, what I'm suggesting to you on the slide here is a, is a, um, a set of things that we think are key enablers um, of the Celtic Sea in particular, but you know, some of that is true across, across the whole UK. And so we're minded to examine how we can um, work with others to uh, speed up development, reduce barriers to market, and maximize local opportunity. And, and those are the topics we're, we're thinking about. Um, and I guess it's important to say, those, so that's fine, that's the what, Tim. Everybody, you know, nobody, I don't think anybody would argue with what's on the slide, but I, I suppose it's important to say how we would like to work with that. And so, you know, how we would like to work with that is actively engaged with uh, localities and regions um, to be in dialogue and collaborating with the market and stakeholders. Um, and the purpose of all of that is to play our part in creating a world leading market in the Celtic Sea and in other Crown Estate waters for floating wind. So um, that concludes my kind of formal remarks. I'm happy to take questions, but I do want to just, if you do have interest, um, help you find out a little bit more. And I'd just like to pick off the two first things on the slide if I can. I mentioned the broad horizons and you saw a snapshot of the output from it there. Uh, if you search for it, you'll find it on our website. If you dig a little deeper, you'll find, and you can't sleep well, uh, you'll find the 150-page technical report um, that accompanied it and supports the analysis. It's excellent work. Um, and uh, for people in the wider online audience who are looking at you know, developing an understanding of the market and how it works and what the technology landscape should be, it's actually very well worth a read. I think you'll find a, a great deal of information in there. I also just wanted to sort of highlight our offshore wind evidence and change program because I think that's illustrative of how we do work already. Um, and uh, that is a 25 million pound investment by us. Um, we partner with DEFRA um, and other bodies to deliver that. There's a very broad participation in that program. And the exam question it's looking to solve is, if we're going to get all of this wind out there to decarbonize our energy system, how do we protect and enhance the environment at the same time? And, and the key point or the most important thing for me in the title of that is the word change. So it's how can we change, what do we need to change, or what, you know, what can we do differently and how can we do it differently that will protect and enhance the environment whilst we get all this critical low carbon infrastructure on the seabed. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Tim. That was excellent. Now, you drew the long straw because obviously we're heading in towards a break in a moment, and uh, I suspect everybody's ready for a breath of fresh air and a coffee. Uh, I think for those in the room, um, Tim's here with us um, through lunch as well, so, so plenty of opportunities to, to ask questions directly. 
Um, but I, I've got one online which I just, just want to pick up, if I may, Tim. Um, I, I, I'll paraphrase, if I may. Great to hear that there's, there's progress being made towards the early commercial rounds, and obviously we, we've got there's more detail to, to follow on that and what that means. Um, but is there a time frame on when that might move forward? I, I'd say, we'll not keep you long. OK. There'll, there'll, <laughs> there'll be more news. Um, and I guess the critical point is, you know, the next steps will be engagement-led. And the reason for that is, um, you know, if we want to get to a leasing round, we have to start to draw some lines on a map on where projects could be. And there are some really important questions in my kind of penultimate slide around um, ports and supply chain and grid that we need to work through with the market and stakeholders. Um, so, for example, you know, does the market have an appetite for early commercial projects which are have perhaps smaller um, and therefore commercially more difficult? You know, does the market have an appetite to work with us to coordinate their locations um, so that some of those challenges around accessing the grid are you know, easier to manage? Um, and it, it would be remiss of us to start doing our detailed design for leasing without taking in those perspectives um, and therefore you know those will those will be featuring the key next steps but in terms of new news um, we'll set out our intentions for that and we won't keep you long perfect i, I think the uh, the answer for for the cornish audience would be directly <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant um, as i say uh, a, a round of applause for tim um uh, i i will form an orderly queue to speak to tim in the break Okay, perfect. So we're going to head off for a break now.